My name is Carolina Gropa. And I'm Matt Fuller, and we are from Autism in Love. And you're listening to Special Chronicles Podcast, giving respect and a voice to people with special needs. This is Special Chronicles, giving respect and a voice to people with special needs. I always knew I was different, but I didn't really understand why, why I couldn't be accepted. I felt incredibly ashamed of being autistic. Sometimes I try to pretend I was never autistic because they would kind of laugh at you. I'm single, by the way. Had one girlfriend, but it didn't quite work out that well. Yes, I'm in love. What does that mean? I don't know, it means to fall in love, to give a, give a kiss and a hug. Love is a very abstract concept that many people with autism have a hard time grasping. I asked her, how would you feel about being in a relationship with me? She said, I could see this may, be, this may work. What did you think when you first met her? It's nice, it was beautiful. Did you think that he would be capable of a romantic relationship? No, I didn't dare hope. You know, I want want an independent girl, but I feel like I can't. If I found a girl that had a job, had a car, had her whole home, I can't be with her. Look, they're up here, I'm down here. Wearing the jewelry kind of makes me feel that sort of false sense of confidence, and it kind of makes me feel less vulnerable. Well, it looks like the weather just came on. I was going to catch a, a, a glimpse here. <clears throat> We're so fixated on our comfort zones. It's sometimes difficult to communicate. I gave Gita a hug. I put my arms around her. Whether someone can love you without truly understanding you, I think it's absolutely possible. I love it when she holds me, hugs me, kisses me, smiles at me. Love is neither visible, measurable. There's no way to quantify it. And what's in here? It's in here. It always will be. How do you know when you're in love? I don't know. Joining us today on the Special Chronicles podcast show, uh, Matt and Kalina, uh, and Matt is the director and producer of the feature-length documentary Autism and Love, and Kalina is the producer of this film. Welcome to Special Chronicles, Matt and, and Kalina. Thank you. Thanks for having us, Daniel. Thanks for having us. <laughs> so uh, I think I, I first found out about your film, um, I think it was on Twitter or somewhere online. Um, <laughs> And I'm, I'm looking, fo looking forward to seeing the film. Um, but um, why don't you uh, first, for our listeners, uh, uh, give us uh, um, an introduction about yourselves um, and a little bit about each of your uh, backgrounds. Sure. Do you want to take take over, Matt? To start. Yeah. Sure. Um, okay. So, so a little bit about our backgrounds, yeah. and yeah, sure. So. Um, like I said, I'm Matt Fuller. I'm the director producer of Autism and Love. Um, yeah, this is my first feature-length film as a director. Uh, also, the first feature-length documentary that I've worked on. Um, my background is in studio-based fictional filmmaking. So I've worked as a development executive on a number of studio films uh, here in Hollywood. Um, and I'm just ever so excited to be sharing Autism and Love with the world. We're getting ready for our uh, first public broadcast and I'm very eager for the public to see the film. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, and I have come up more from the sort of independent side of things, uh, other other side of the spectrum, pun intended. Um, <laughs> and uh, this is also my first feature-length project, feature-length film, also documentary. And and one special thing we always like to note is that um, neither Matt nor myself knew anything about autism before this documentary. Which is to, be, fun. To, be fa to be fair, we have both seen Rain Man. Yes. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um, with that kind of not um, having that much background about um, autism, um, how did this 
documentary get started for you guys? Yeah, um, so it actually started with uh, a doctor who is also our executive producer. His name is Ira Halesdale, and he has been in the autism field for about 20 years. And at the time, I had been working as an administrative assistant to him, and he wanted to do research on the topic of adults with autism and romantic relationships. And when I started um, helping him with that research, we quickly realized that there was nothing done on the topic. And so from there, you know, he wasn't sure if he wanted to write a book or a blog on this topic. And so we quickly um, started getting together what became the research part of this project. And from there, Matt got involved and we saw, you know, the need uh, to share this story because there's so much out there on kids um, with autism but nothing about what's going to happen to these kids once they grow up and have these needs and desires like everybody else and so um, from there we, we did about six months of research here locally in Los Angeles and we sort of immersed ourselves into the autism community down here through uh, meetup groups and sort of uh, parent support groups and all, anybody that would take us basically, we, we went in and said, hey, we're here to learn and we don't know anything about this, but we, we want to help tell an honest and compelling story um, about the reality of romantic relationships and those desires and, and with people with autism. And so that's sort of the genesis of the, of the project. And I think, you know, from there we, we sort of use that process as a bit of casting and then yeah, by the end of that year, we had the people we wanted to follow and, and sort of all the tools and financing we needed to shoot this film, which we shot for about a year in 2013. And, and here we are. It's <laughs> been a ride. <laughs> <laughs> so did you guys know anybody with autism um, prior to beginning the um, research process? How, um, how, what, was this really your first kind of introduction mm -hmm. to to working with people with autism? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, for me, it was it was really the first time I knew or got to know anybody with autism on a on a personal level. Um, I had a professor in college who I knew had a son with autism, and there had been you know kind of a few acquaintances I knew whose lives had been touched by autism, but I really didn't know anybody personally who had been affected by it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, same. In, in working with Ira, I had met some people um, on the spectrum, but I never had a sort of, you know, personal and more direct connection or, or conversation with, with them. Mm. So, what have both of you guys learned uh, um, from, from working on this film about autism? Mm. <clears throat> well, I mean, you know, uh, innumerable things really I mean it's been such a um, a rich learning experience and an, and uh, really an experiential experience um, but I think the thing that that most resonates with me there's kind of two things one is the complexity and uniqueness of each person on the autism spectrum um, I really had did not have a, a thorough appreciation for um, how vast and expansive autism can be and uh, how uniquely it can manifest itself in, in the individuals on the spectrum. So I think I gained a deeper, more authentic appreciation for um, for autism, and, you know, as kind of as a as a part of this process. And then, of course, making a film about romance, uh, you know, necessitates you ponder your own concept of of romantic love. And uh, you know, I think that that changed and and sort of matured as the film was was going on and. Um, and continues to every time I, I watch the movie. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so Carolina, did you have anything to add there? Yeah, I was just going to say, I, to, I agree with everything Matt said, but just also piggyback, I think it just teaches you on a grander level just a little bit more of compassion and awareness for all people yeah. who society wants to define as different from us. and and how we are more alike than different in so many ways, especially when it comes to romantic love. Um, that was definitely a big lesson that I took away from it. Neat. Absolutely. Uh, so, um, uh, Matt, how did you come to direct and produce um, this film? And then, Carolina, um, um, how, how did you come to produce this film? You mentioned... Um, um, 
one of your other pu producers, Iowa, had mm -hmm. um, had 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 kind of introduced you guys to to this um, story. But can, can you share with us uh, any behind the scenes um, story sure. of, of how you guys came to to direct and produce this film? Sure. Yeah, I mean, my, my version of that's pretty short. Carolina brought me into the project. Um, we, we knew each other in college, and um, I'll let her explain the rest, but, but she brought me into the fold. Yeah, um, I, I actually, working with Ira, the doctor you were mentioning, who's now our executive producer and, and partner in this project, was more of a, a day job for me. Um, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm, I've kind of come up through the independent side of the industry, and so that requires juggling a nine to five, if you will, while tackling other projects that I want to be focusing on. So independent films, uh, short films, commercials, all of that stuff. So I knew um, about my interest and my passions and where they were very early on from before I hired him. I was very candid with him about you know, what I wanted out of working with him and why I wanted that job. And so he knew that I had a past and a lot of understanding of production and and film and so when he pitched me the I had a very preliminary understanding that he had some of the knowledge and the know-how of how to make something of this scale happen and from there um, as Matt mentioned you know we were looking for someone who could direct this and Matt was the first person that came to mind because it's such a sensitive subject matter and really requires a lot of finesse and tact and, and handling you know how are you going to get people anyone really but people who are very particular and can take a lot of time to open up to trust you very quickly with a camera in their face you know and I definitely had a, a feeling that Matt was going to be able to do that which as you can see from the film he definitely did yeah, yeah. Uh, so can you guys share with us um, uh, any other personal um, um, uh, stories of why you decided to go ahead and um, produce this film. Is, is there any other, from going through the uh, 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 filmmaking process and, 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 and talking with the individuals that you have featured in the film, can, can you share with us any uh, any Inspiring stories um, that that really made you decide uh, to wait um, uh, finish producing the film. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, without giving too much away about the film, there there are a lot of inspiring moments in the film that we, of course, didn't discover until we were making it. Yeah. That reinforced that idea of of commitment to the project, <clears throat> but. From the beginning, on a grander scale, the idea of creating a film that was not only um, a, a, a compelling cinematic experience, but also something that that had some kind of pro-social um, agenda behind it, was really compelling to me. I mean, the idea of being able to um, further a conversation, or, or in many cases, begin a conversation about adults with autism and their romantic lives. Um, promised to be very fulfilling for me. So, so that was certainly a draw. Yeah, and I, I think using, you know, my skills and um, knowledge to create something that helps people is, is definitely not, uh, producing documentaries is never something I thought I would do. You know, if you had told me four years ago, like, hey, you're going to be working on this thing with autism, I would have said, that's crazy, because I knew nothing about it. I'd never produced a documentary. Um, but it really is true, and I feel like it, it's, it's a gift that's been handed to me, and I think I speak for Matt, because we didn't know anything about this topic, and we were so quickly embraced by the community, and, and to be honest, like, it almost feels like the stories that unfolded and presented themselves to us were just so incredible, and when you watch the film and you see what we were able to get and the access that we had in such a limited amount of time, it really is one of those things that I believe on a spiritual level was sort of meant to be, you know, how everything just aligned. Sorry about that, guys. Me. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, phone's off. 
<laughs> uh, so it just everything aligning the way it did, it's something we could never have planned for. And I mean, I could not have planned for it in my wildest dreams. And so um, to be on the other side of that, I mean, going through that process of making a film was very, this, this process was very scary because it's a documentary and these people's lives don't stop just because we stop rolling, uh, you know, cameras. And so to, to really trust that the stories that we ended up getting were going to unfold while they were unfolding, it was very scary, but also exhilarating. And to be on the other side of it and looking at we've been, what we've been able to create and how it keeps affecting people and audiences every time we screen it and talk to people like yourself, I mean, that is, that is the greatest gift. And I don't think I ever expected in my wildest dreams when we started this endeavor like almost four years ago that that this is where we would be now. So, mm. so um, our guest today on Special Chronicles are Matt and Kalina from the um, feature length documentary Autism in Love. Uh, so, share with us a little bit about how you came to feature the individuals with autism in the film, and and did you hear any as you were filming their stories? What, what were some of their thoughts uh, about having their stories and their romantic love um, stories to be shown uh, on film? Well, let me make sure I understand your question. You're, you're wondering about some stories that actually kind of uh, unfolded for us in the making yeah. of the film? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think we probably... Don't want to give too much away at this point, just because our broadcast is right around the corner. But it suffice to say, um, it was important to us to capture a range of stories that represented, um, you know, the, the the breadth of romance. Right. So you're kind of like three pillars to that. You're either looking for a romantic relationship, you're in a relationship, or you're on your way out of one. Um, and and I think we were fortunate enough to capture stories that satisfied each of those three pillars. Um, you know, and then of course we wanted to be able to showcase the breadth of, of people on the spectrum. So, you know, um, one film cannot accurately represent the entire autism spectrum, but it was certainly important to us to have diversity in the way that people were affected by autism um, that showed up on screen. So, so that was really important to us. Um, and I think in terms of specific stories, you know, <clears throat> um, I, guess we can, I guess we can say that a lot of very meaningful events take place in each of the subjects' lives, and we were fortunate enough to capture that, and it's in the movie. Mm -hmm. So, um, Kaolina, can you share with us um, how you found the individuals um, whose stories you um, both wanted to tell throughout the film. Yeah, you mean how we found the people that ended up participating in the yeah, film? It would do that through the research process that you were talking about yeah. earlier? Yeah, that. definitely. We, we ended up talking to, I want to say, about 40 adults uh, with autism on camera in the research process. And uh, from there, we ended up selecting, just through their interest and their openness to us, you know, being a part of their lives, we ended up following, I want to say, about two or three of those. And then from there, it just became word of mouth. You know, somebody knew somebody, and we would meet people and sort of assess, would they be interesting? How would they fit, maybe, in the grand scheme of this story? Um, and then we actually followed nine individuals. Um, and in the actual film, you'll see it's only four <coughs> storylines. I'm sorry, three storylines. So it's six. Uh, trying to map in my head. Four individuals for four individuals. three yeah. stories. <laughs> three story yeah. Lines, exactly. Yeah. Um, but that, you know, in the span of the nine months we were in production, we followed a lot more people and, you know, for many reasons they were not in the in the final cut of the film, but it's not because their stories weren't as compelling. It just we just can't you know, that's more of a mini series than a documentary. We just mm. have so much footage that we, we would love to share. But that I think Matt can attest to the fact that we felt the stories that we ended up with were the most interesting to the narrative that we were wanting to tell and the thesis of romantic relationships on the spectrum. So, um, Matt, I'm kind of speaking to that, how, how did you come to um, find that uh, a, a narrative and, um, and 
I'm assuming that you, you guys had a lot of footage. So how, how do how do you guys come to break down um, all all the footage that you had to really find a co compound narrative for the uh, viewers? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, that that really is the editorial process of, of filmmaking in a nutshell. So, you know, in the beginning, when you're selecting people to put in front of the camera, um, you're not scripting, but you're looking for people who are in pursuit of something or at least show the promise of change over the course of production. Um, that change can be small uh, or big, um, but just, you know, the pursuit of something is, is generally what you're looking for. And then when you're in the editorial process, um, it's shading away the things that distract from that through line um, and, and, you know, leaving those on the cutting room floor, as it were, um, to, to create a lean kind of narrative. And when you're creating something with an ensemble cast like this, each of those stories complements the other to say something grander and, and, and larger and affect the audience in a particular way. And so while, while a singular story may be very interesting and compelling, um, when you juxtapose that to three or four others, it may detract from the meta narrative in a way that uh, you know is not healthy for the film. So it's a tough process, and it's it's never easy, particularly when you get so close to subjects and you've spent so much time with them. It's never easy to not include those in the final product. But you know, again, like Carolina said, it's it's in service of the the narrative that we wanted to tell and to. Um, make it as lean and effective as possible. Um, and did you guys have to get permission from the individuals um, as you, because you guys filmed a, a lot of a, a lot of different people, and then you, as you said, you edited it down. Um, what um, from the people that didn't really make the final cut? Can can you show? Did did, did you hear any? Being from from those individuals as as well as the individuals that you that that ended up making the the final cut of the film. Yeah, I mean, you know, as far as the folks who didn't end up in the final cut of the film, um, you know, those were those were difficult conversations. Of course, we wanted to be candid about that and let them know that ahead of time. Um, and those are those are you know not easy conversations to have, but. Um, everyone was very gracious and understanding, and I, I think everyone who, you know, put themselves in front of the camera in this project was, uh, you know, interested in the cause, and, and they trusted that um, we were making the decisions that were right for, for that agenda, and uh, I don't think they took that personally. Um, and everybody who's in the film, you know, is, is a strong supporter as well, and I think that they... <clears throat> they really put a lot into the process and the project, and uh, I I think they're proud of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so can, can you show? Can, can you both um, sh uh, share with us a little bit about the uh, mission of the film? Um, can, what 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 do you guys um, um, hope that the viewers will really gain from like? If you could kind of put together uh, a mission statement of what you really hope um, the viewers will learn from the film, what? Um... Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I, you know, my thought is that I I hope that it doesn't um, feel so much like learning or taking away, but rather experiencing, um, and and that is experiencing the lives of adults with autism as they pursue something that is universally desired. Um, I hope, as a result of those experiences, the audience has a more complete and complex understanding of what an autism spectrum disorder is. Um, and I hope, I hope they also reevaluate or maybe um, challenge their own ideas of romantic connection and, and what it means to be connected to someone in that way. Um, do you have anything to to add to that about the, the mission of... Yeah, uh, I think Matt, you know, pretty much hit everything on, on the head um, there, but, um, you know, I think it's, to reiterate, it's just the, the power of, of documentaries to allow us to um, 
sort of be a, be a part of someone else's experience in a really safe way, an honest way, I think is such a great tool, you know, to give people that access. And so um, the compassion and just the conversations, I think if people, if this can be the beginning of a conversation that I think needs to get started, um, then I feel like we've done our part of the, to start the piece of the puzzle. Neat. So is there a uh, inspiring moment that you guys um, found from from working on the film, though, with with any of the cast of the film, or any kind of in, inspiring behind the scenes story that uh, that that you that you that you took away from, from the film? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I I think that um, there's so much of that; it's really hard to pick yeah. one. And, and you know, again, I want to leave enough for people who are listening to this to enjoy the surprises in the film. So I'll just say it's chock full of them. But um, I, had this, I had this moment the other day, uh, and this has happened a few times throughout like the film's life in film festivals and, and such, um, but I, I did a YouTube search uh, for Autism and Love and came across a review that a few folks um, had done of the film. They had seen it in a, in a community screening that PBS had facilitated. and They were reviewing the film, and, and they themselves had some developmental challenges. And it was just almost like an out-of-body experience to watch um, other people have this really deep emotional reaction to something um, that we worked so hard on to create and, and to watch it be out there in the world on its own and do exactly what we hoped it would do was really very moving for me. Yeah, I agree with Matt. There's a lot of you know great stories from production, but I think personally for me, the strongest, um, most memorable stories definitely have come from some of the Q and A's that we've been doing since the film has you know gone to festivals and whatnot, and just being able to share the film with an audience, sitting sitting with the audience as they watch it, and then being there right after to be a part of that emotional experience and answer questions. And talk to people who are on the spectrum and have people come up to us and share their stories and how it's affected them. And, and I mean, that is at every single time for me is it just, just like a transformative experience and definitely pulls at my heartstrings and is just a, a constant reminder of doing something that is so beyond myself or my own sort of career ambitions. Yeah, neat. So you both mentioned that, that you showed the film at 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 a few different film festivals. Uh, can you um, share with us uh, the response you got from the, from the viewers uh, who um, saw that film? Mm -hmm. Was it um, were there, um, um, others who had autism who were in the audience, or um, Kevin, you mentioned yeah. um, a few stories. That you that you can can you both um, share some of that with our listeners? Yeah, there was a little boy, and I, I can't remember. It's it's definitely a high class problem, you know, which of the festivals it was at. I, I want to say it was either um, in San Francisco or in Arkansas. But uh, his mom, after the film, was crying, I believe, because. She, I guess she was nervous about him watching it. He was young. He was probably, do you remember him that? Yeah. Like if 10 years old? Yeah, at Bentonville. In Bentonville. Right. Yeah, <laughs> so that that little boy, he, he didn't say much, you know. He didn't say much to us, but seeing how his mom was affected, and even though he didn't verbalize much, his body language spoke otherwise, and he wanted to be around us after and wanted to take photos with us, and he was just so excited by it all. So the effect it had on him, I, I don't know. I, I can't speak for that. But the way he, it was shown to us through his mom and, and through him, that for me was very touching, extremely touching and memorable. Yeah. I remember a moment in... Um, we, we had the chance to show the film uh, in Querétaro, Mexico. And it was one of the first times that the, the film had been screened in a foreign language. So in other words, it was, it was subtitled. And... Um, you know, I mean, I was I was worried about how the film would translate if it would if it would cross the language barrier, and it was so moving to see the audience's reaction. I remember a mother 
kind of similar to the story Carolina just shared, coming up to me after the film, speaking in Spanish through a translator, um, and just in tears because she, she, for the first time, felt hope for her son, uh, hope that he might have a relationship someday and that love was possible for him. So, you know, watching, seeing those reactions out in the world is really the best part of the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, who do you guys hope that the, um, this, that the audience is, or who do you hope that the, who is, when you made the film, uh, who was, who did you have in mind for the film? Mm-hmm. Be geared for, is it geared for more others with autism, like the ones that, that, that were featured in the film, or is it for, um, people who may not have autism, or, yeah, I mean, I think we want both of those demographics to see and appreciate the film, but for my money, what's what's more important um, are the people who don't have a relationship with autism, who don't know much about autism, um, or are maybe a little intimidated by autism. Um, th- those are the people that I hope see the film and, and grow the most from it, because they stand to gain um, as much, if not more, than than those who are on the spectrum or have someone in their life already that is on the spectrum. That being said, the idea of inspiration and hope going to folks who are on the spectrum or maybe have a child on the spectrum, um, that's a really, that was always something that we wanted to to deliver on. Yeah. Neat. So our uh, guest today is on uh, Special Chronicles on Matt and Camino from the feature links to documentary Autism in Love. Uh, now, um, were any of the cast in the film, were any of them um, self-advocates uh, uh, within the autism or special needs community, or did you have any self-advocates consult on the film? Uh, I, I think I might have read somewhere, and I may have this wrong, but I think um, um, Kiwi um, Nagro, who's a self I don't know if, 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 if you guys have done any work with him or he's a self advocate on Yeah, I, I remember Kerry. We I think we bumped into him first on a, on the Huffington Post and we became friendly and I I think that he was came to see a movie in Tribeca. Carolyn yeah. yeah. Yeah he did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was in, in Tribeca. Um, he didn't uh, so he saw the movie after it was done and, and yeah. had some really kind things to say about it. Um, two of our subjects, Lindsay and Dave, um, who are a couple um, they are, are self advocates. They do a lot of speaking. Um, they do. Uh, they're they're very instrumental in the community and and uh, are really very effective speakers and advocates for the community. Neat. Neat. Uh, and did, did you guys did you guys um, use any of that feedback from any of the self advocates, or, or or did Kelly provide any feedback for you guys and? So you guys made sure to, to, to have an accurate uh, story through the film? Mm-hmm. Well, um, you know, like I mentioned, Carrie saw the movie after it was, it was done, and so um, he didn't really provide any feedback in, in that capacity. Um, but I think once you see the film, you'll, you'll appreciate that there, there's, you know, we're not doing a lot to editorialize autism, yeah, we're letting the subject speak for themselves, and so um, it, the movie become like, in a sense, the autism goes away pretty quickly because we're not talking about it. We're just yeah. experiencing these folks' lives, and so as as accurate as we wanted to be, and and make sure that we were authentically portraying um, our subjects, we we didn't want um, any heavy hands kind of molding the impression that we were giving of autism because we we wanted it to come from our subjects. Yeah. So, would you guys say that 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 you let the well, well that the viewers will hopefully gain that the individuals that you guys had 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 focused the the um, the, the few stories to to be on uh, that that the individuals uh, just like everybody else and, and and that the autism that they may have is just in the background, uh, and, and isn't the really focus? Yeah, I mean, I, I hope that you know people recognize that autism is one part of these people. Yeah. They're people first. They're complex, unique individuals, just like everybody else. They have their own wants and desires and 
fears, concerns, hopes, and dreams. Um, and, and autism isn't all they are. They happen to have autism, and that presents unique challenges in, in many of their pursuits. Um, but that said, it doesn't, it doesn't define who they are. And so, yeah, I hope that people who are not on the spectrum watching the film do relate to them um, and, and relate to the things they're going through in pursuit of romance. Mm. Uh, Kevin, what are you going to add anything to? Uh, no. Uh, so can you share with us um, briefly about some of the themes that you hope that the viewers will gain from the film? Well, I think Carolina touched on one that's really important earlier, which is compassion and empathy. Um, and, and maybe the most important, you know, just just understanding that each person is going through a unique journey with a unique set of challenges and um, offering compassion and understanding to people you meet and, and may not know the breadth or depth of their story um, is a theme that I think is pretty evident in the film. Um, and then the other one that jumps out is, is self-love, self-care, um, and acceptance of yourself. Neat. Uh, so um, this week is, um, we'll in a conversation today, either before Monday or kind of right around uh, Monday, January 11th. Um, the the, uh, the the film is going to be airing on PBS uh, as part of the Independent Lens series, uh, and, and and then as we before going on air, uh, you mentioned that this spring uh, it's going to be coming on to uh, on Netflix. Uh, can can you, can you share with us some, um, both of your thoughts on on the film um, up, um, to to appear on PBS? And then, uh, and, and then coming up uh, in, in the spring on um, Netflix. And she oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, it, the 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 more people that can see the film, the better. Mm-hmm. Um, and PBS Independent Lens has proved to be such an amazing partner in in getting this film out there. Um, I mean, they have, a, they have a huge reach, they have a f- huge viewership, but they've also just embraced the film, become really big fans of it, and, and pushed hard to make it visible to as many people as possible. So that's really exciting. Um, you know, and the Netflix component of it, I, I think, Daniel, you and I were chatting before we got started here about um, how exciting that is. I think that our generation consumes most of their media, particularly documentaries, through Netflix. Yeah. Um, and I think we just got a detail that it looks like right now the release date for Autism in Love on Netflix is going to be April 1st, which uh, fortunately is, coincides with National uh, Autism Awareness Month. Yeah. It's actually on uh, the second, and Autism Awareness Day is on the second, so it's actually like a really great, sorry to interrupt Matt, just a great no, no. plan to, to kick off the month. I, I wonder if that's mm-hmm. why they did that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> sneaky Netflix. Um, yeah. But that, that's that's really exciting. I mean, just you know, just to have the film out there uh, is is amazing. Um, when you're making a project like this, you you run the risk of it like living on a hard drive somewhere and never seeing the light of day. So that it's getting the attention it is feels like um, really something very special. Neat, neat. Uh, and Kaylina, do you have any additional thoughts to share about that, uh, about the film appearing on PBS and then um, on April first on Netflix? No, I, I'm I'm just grateful the film is getting you know seen and that many people will have access to it and hope that um, it'll become a platform for people to start uh, having this discussion and that they also know that we are accessible to them. You know, we're on Facebook and social media. We're very active and through our website and whatnot. And it'll be great to hear from people what they think and um, how the film resonates with them. So, uh, speaking of that, um, uh, where can our listeners find out more uh, about the film? You mentioned that you guys are accessible on social media. Yeah. Any, any plugs to share? Sure. With yeah, autisminlove.com is our hub. So there you can find information on purchasing the film everywhere. Um, you can find out screenings that we have coming up, if any, and uh, also links to all of our social media. And there's also a contact form on there if anybody decides they want to reach out to us. Neat. And, uh, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that once it's on Netflix, 
will you guys put a link up on there? Or, or yeah. Yeah, we're mostly active through our Facebook page. That's mm -hmm. where we post most of our updates uh, about the film. So definitely if people want to like us on Facebook, and it's just facebook.com slash autism and love, that's where we post most of the news that we have. Neat. Um, one thing I um, forgot to ask, but um, how did you guys come up with the, the title, um, <laughs> uh, um, um, Autism in Love? Is, is that mainly because of the um, um, storylines that you guys had? Or? I, I, I think actually the credit for that inadvertently goes to our executive producer, Ira, yeah. who, who <laughs> wrote, it, wrote it in a context that was not, I don't think, intended to be the title. Yeah. Um, or at least the final title of the project, but I, I fell in love with it. I, I think Carolina did too. Yeah. And and then it just didn't go away. And I um, uh, I love the title. I think that's one of the coolest parts of the movie. <laughs> yeah. And we honestly couldn't, we thought for a while, oh, we'll try to, later on, we'll try to maybe find something else that fits mm -hmm. this better, but nothing really matched how much is said by the title in so few words even if it isn't, I think, what is it, grammatically correct? <laughs> as, as the Hollywood Reporter so eloquently highlighted. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, how can our listeners um, watch the film, on, um, depending on when they hear this, on um, uh, January 11th, 2016 on PBS? So, but is it also, yeah. is, is it going to air again on PBS? So mm -hmm. you, you mentioned before going on air that it will also be on your website and PBS holds. Uh, yeah. So um, a good place to start is PBS.org, uh, and you can you can look at your local listing times. They it may vary by an hour or so in, depending on where you live, um, but but the the standard broadcast time is 10 p.m. on Monday, January 11th. Um, if folks miss that, PBS will be streaming it uh, through their website uh, for a week following the broadcast. Um, the other opportunity you have is to visit us at autismandlove.com. Uh, there we have links to all the digital retailers, iTunes, Amazon, Google Play, etc. if you want to download a copy of the film. Uh, and very shortly, we are also going to be offering uh, DVDs and Blu-rays through our website. Awesome. Awesome. Um, and um, will we um, um, be able to... Um, um, give away a copy of the DVD uh, to our listeners? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, we'd have to just circle back on that because we are uh, in the middle of figuring out the manufacturing yeah. And, yeah. and procedure of all that stuff. But, but uh, we we'll love on um, off air. Uh, right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, any, uh, go back to my, my uh, notes here. Uh, any final thoughts about um, your um, overall time here today on, on the Pascalingos that you'd like to share with, the, with our listeners? Uh, you know, I just, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here and share our thoughts with you, and uh, we hope your listeners find a way to, to see the film and share it with all their friends, and if they have any feedback, thoughts, questions, or concerns, um, we'd love to hear from them. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And the other just sort of thing I like to preface with is that um, it's okay to laugh. You know, we have a lot of funny moments in the film that are not poking fun or at, at anyone. It's just the humor in, in life. And um, I think if people go in with the permission, knowing that they can laugh at certain things, that it helps, helps them in the experience. Well, awesome. Uh, thank you again for uh, taking the time to come on, on Pitch Chronicles, and, uh, and I look forward to, to um, staying in touch. Thank, thank you. you. Thank so you much. so much. Have a good one. Special Chronicles. Giving respect and a voice to people with special needs.